Yeah, welcome to uh, the Probable Algorithms in uh, Machine Learning uh, session. Uh, I hope you'll see a happy mixture of theory and machine learning in this session. We have three speakers. Um, we are glad to have as our first speaker, Sham Kakaday, who is on the University of Washington Computer Science faculty. He holds the data science chair there. Uh, he has been at Microsoft before that and University of Pennsylvania. So here is Sham. Uh, thanks, Ravi, uh, and thanks to Patik for inviting me. It's always great to be back at uh, MSR. So I'm going to be speaking about uh, some work in a line of work related to uh, optimal statistical estimation. And uh, these are problems with regards to how we discover uh, hidden structure in our data. And they're problems which I think underlie many of the challenges that we face in a variety of scientific and uh, engineering settings. Okay, and you know, you could think of some problem where you have a speech signal and you have lots of data of audio waveforms and we'd like to discover, uh, say, phone concepts like phonemes or underlying structure in our data in an automated way. Okay, but many of the settings uh, we have are discrete and let me start by giving uh, an example uh, where we have uh, our data in a count format. So let's look at an example, say, from something like uh, maybe natural language processing, uh, where uh, we have a count matrix of co occurrences of words. Okay, so, uh, so think of a matrix where on one axis uh, represents one word and another axis uh, represents, uh, say, another set of words. And we put a dot in this table uh, if words i and j co occur. Okay, so many of the data we have are, look like this. It, we it can be an integer rather than uh, just a dot. And, and now our job is to try to figure out some structure in this data. Okay, and this is what it looks like. Uh, but what we'd like is our data to be presented in this format. Here, all I've done is taken uh, this matrix, and I've permuted the rows and the columns to make the structure a little more visible. Okay, so, uh, and, and basically there's a grouping of the words, uh, you might think of these as topics, uh, of which things co-occur together. Okay, so uh, the underlying problem here is basically, you know, in this very naive model, it's to sort of a uh, swap around the rows and columns so the underlying structure becomes more clear. Okay, and uh, nobody tells us this grouping. Okay, and, and, you know, many of the, these uh, latent variable models we, uh, that, that we seek to estimate in practice, uh, problems like this are the underlying subproblem. Okay, so, uh, if there's questions, uh, I'll define the model a little more precisely, but at a high level, this is, uh, this is kind of what the data look like. Okay, so, uh, you know, how do we learn some of these uh, latent variable models? Uh, you know, there's a lot of heuristics out there, like k-means em. Uh, in, in terms of this natural language processing setting, uh, it's sort of related to some of these embedding methods. I'll, I'll touch upon them. Uh, briefly. Now, with regards to, uh, to theory, uh, there's a number of us that have been working on uh, sort of provable methods for estimating hidden structure. And by provable, what, what do we mean here? We mean we get data, we'd like to, say, discover topics or estimate an HMM. And, uh, you know, the short answer for a line of work by uh, a, number, a number of people, including people in the audience is that for uh, a variety of these models, we have computationally efficient algorithms to estimate the underlying structure. Okay, so this means I'm just going to give you a table of this form and I want you to do the grouping and I want you to do this efficiently without kind of trying all possibilities. Uh, and there are in fact computationally efficient algorithms to do this, uh, but you know, there's a difference between provable and practical. So many of the, these, these methods we developed, in theory they work fine uh, if our sample size is very large, okay? And 
you know, so, so the, the style of guarantee that if we have enough data, then in a relatively small amount of computation time, we'll recover the, the hidden structure. Okay, but, you know, what we care about in is that, you know, I don't necessarily really care about just being provable. I want scalable algorithms that work well in practice. Okay, and I'm going to argue uh, in a moment that, in fact, uh, many of these, uh, uh, these algorithms uh, actually are not going to be effective in practical settings that we care about in a variety uh, of disciplines. Okay, but, but first let me give you uh, some insight as to you know, what the basic idea is. Okay, I'll, do it. I'll, gi I'll give the basic idea of these algorithms with uh, a pretty, uh, actually a, a really practical algorithm. Uh, it's one which uh, I think works, uh, works pretty well out of the box. Uh, I think in, in some regimes it's competitive with some of these uh, kind of neural network based embeddings, but it's super simple and robust. Okay, so, so suppose we have a uh, corpus of natural language. Okay, and I want to uh, figure out how to group words together. And I have a word like philosophy and maybe I have a word like topology. Okay, I have no idea if how, how close they are and the words themselves uh, are completely disparate. Right, the word red and green, they have nothing to do with each other. Just di they're different symbols. Okay, but what you could do is, for every word in your corpus, try to predict the word that follows it. Okay, so for every word W, let phi of W be the word that follows it. Okay, a and the idea is words like red and green, even though the words themselves are different, they're going to precede very similar words. Okay, so the idea is, the step one is, First, you take your words, build a prediction of what follows it. Okay. Then what you're going to do is cluster the mappings of what follows the words. So for every word, you have a vector of what types of things follow it. Then you cluster those vectors. Okay. So this is a way to get groupings uh, or embeddings of, of words. It works, uh, it works really quite well in many different settings. Uh, and it's extremely uh, easy to implement. And there's, in fact, been papers arguing that these neural, neural network methods are basically doing the same thing. They're doing some kind of, uh, uh, you know, you can implement this idea with a singular value decomposition. Uh, it's actually sort of related to some work uh, Percy did in his uh, master's thesis, which also works well in this setting on, on uh, Brown clustering. Okay, so, uh, so this is a very intuitive way to to try to learn word embeddings by just trying to figure out uh, what words follow uh, some word and then group and, and do the grouping based on that. Okay. So the problem with this method and many others, uh, and, and both both in practice and in theory, is that uh, in practice the distribution over words uh, are very heavy tailed. Okay, so this is true uh, not just in natural language processing, uh, it's true with uh, a lot of data we have that's coming from the sciences. So for example, in healthcare data, uh, in genomics data, the events of interest are really not going to occur very many times. But the data we have is basically uh, tables of zeros. Okay, and and when we'd like to understand this hidden structure and say how to group things together, we're really faced with this problem that uh, our data are very, very sparse. And in, in this regime, uh, many of these, uh, these, met you know, these methods I mentioned actually don't work. So in particular, this table here, in practice, we're not going to get a table that's as dense as this. It's basically going to be a bunch of zeros. Okay. And And, and I'd argue that, you know, why we care about provable learning uh, here is that in this regime, it's actually, like we know from simple theoretical examples, we know that uh, algorithms fail and getting this right is actually uh, very difficult. And, and the in intuitive reason is that, um, you know, as our data sets grow, uh, we're going to see more new events and new words. So effectively, in many settings, 
uh, even though we're in this quote unquote big data regime, it's still effectively a small sample size because we're seeing more and more new words. Okay, so uh, you know, in other regimes that isn't the case, but many of the scientific disciplines, uh, we really are in this small sample regime uh, because the size of a vocabulary is very large, and as we get data, we're just going to see more and more new words. Okay, and, uh, and, and this is the question. How do we learn in this regime when uh, our data are very sparse? And, and these questions are really fundamentally related to some of these ideas in sparse random graph theory, where you have some random graph, you believe maybe there's some communities in it, uh, maybe two in the simplest case, and you want to discover them. Uh, but the key point is this graph is very, very uh, sparse. Th there's not, um, you know, the edges aren't uh, kind of everywhere. Okay. So, uh, so, so this is the, the basic challenge we're trying to address. And, and, and the key is we'd like to do estimation uh, with a sample size that grows linear in the vocabulary size. Because uh, if, I, if I really need a very dense matrix for an algorithm to, the to, algorithm to work, it's just not going to be applicable uh, in, in many different settings, uh, particularly like in these healthcare settings and uh, some of these natural language processing settings for the real words. Okay, so I'm really just going to try to go through a, a toy example to, to show you how we can connect some of these ideas in uh, graph theory to, uh, to these uh, hidden structure models. Okay, so uh, let's start with the, the simplest model. Uh, this is a two-topic model. So, so think of a setting where uh, we're going to get a collection of documents, uh, and every document is about one topic. Okay, and and uh, I'm going to make a co-occurrence matrix by I'm going to look I'm going to try to estimate which words co-occur together. Okay, so uh, let's model. Let's suppose there's two topics in the world, so maybe math and philosophy. Uh, and P is a distribution of a math words. Q is a distribution of a philosophy words. So PI is the probability of word I under, say, the math topic, and uh, QI is the probability of word I under the philosophy topic. Okay, and we're going to say the joint probability of seeing two words together, so say a word like uh, maybe topology in Descartes, we're going to model it as uh, first we flip a coin and decide which topic it is, so we have a half a half, and then we sample the two words under that topic. Okay, so we're assuming this co-occurrence matrix has a particular rank two structure. Okay, so the question's about uh, the model. Okay, so uh, another way to think of this is uh, this is the model for how we are sampling that count matrix. So we're going to put a dot in uh, that matrix uh, with the probability um, pi plus pi times pj plus qi times qj. Okay, and this means that uh, the expected matrix we see is this rank two matrix, which is pp transpose plus qq transpose. Okay, and this is really uh, a subproblem for estimating things like topic models, hidden Markov models, LDA, and community detection. So we can understand this well. Uh, the claim is this generalizes to many other of these richer latent variable settings. Okay. So, uh, so the question is, how do we estimate uh, P and Q? Okay, and uh, it's a rank two matrix. So uh, we can't just do the SVD because these are uh, probability vectors, our P and Q. Uh, but suppose we know this bigram matrix, this M by M matrix for now. Okay, so uh, what can we do? Well, the first point is that, um, okay, so uh, our goal is to try to estimate this model uh, with samples. Okay, and I'm going to sketch an algorithm which estimates this model uh, with a sample size that's linear in the size of the, uh, in the number of, in the vocabulary size, which is M. So we've got M words in the vocabulary. 
And note that this matrix is of size m squared. Okay, so we're going to try to estimate this with uh, linear and m samples. Okay, and that's the crucial uh, uh, aspect of this because uh, this means that the number of entries we're actually going to see uh, is, is a vanishing fraction of this matrix. Okay, so. Um, and, and this subproblem is really relevant to, to many problems in, um, as I mentioned, in, in graph theory and community detection. Okay, so, so here's the basic idea of how uh, we can recover this matrix. Okay, so, so note we can decompose this matrix into basically a matrix in terms of P plus Q and P minus Q. Okay, and P plus Q is easy to estimate from the data because that's just the marginal distribution over words in our language. Right? So to estimate P plus Q, this is trivial. I just look and see how often words occur. Okay? And then I get a half P plus a half Q. Okay? And, and, and now what do we need to learn? We just need to learn the difference of these two vectors. Okay. And uh, so, so if I had enough data, uh, here would be the algorithm, which is first I estimate the marginal distribution of a words in the language. Then I estimate this bigram matrix. And if I had enough data, I'll estimate this, say, near to exactly. Then I subtract off the marginal distribution. So that's this uh, row, row transpose. And what's left is a rank one matrix, uh, which I is of the form P minus Q, P minus Q transpose, which is the difference. Okay? Then I just do an SVD on that because it's rank one. And then I know the difference. All right. So, so basically, I'm, uh, I first estimate the sum. Then I take my bigram matrix, manipulate it to be rank 1. And then I estimate the difference. Okay. And then I can use those to find uh, P and Q. Okay. And uh, this is very related to that sort of uh, algorithm I, I, I mentioned by uh, Daniel Su uh, based on uh, co-occurrence <laughs> statistics. Uh, and you know many of these uh, techniques are similar in spirit to this one. Okay, so, so the reason this algorithm uh, will not work is due to the fact that uh, we're going to need a super linear number of samples to get these matrices accurate, accurate enough for this algorithm to succeed. Okay, and basically, uh, we really need to see the rare words many, many times uh, before this algorithm will succeed. And the intuition is that just by chance, uh, certain events uh, are going to occur more often than they should. Okay, so so what will happen is there will be certain dense rows in this matrix that are a bit more dense than they should be. And then when you do the SVD operation, uh, it will actually not succeed. Okay, and Th there's arguments that these issues come up uh, even with, uh, even in uh, uh, with other methods like in these natural language processing settings. Uh, people look at these neural network methods, and it looks like they're getting the distributions of the rare words uh, pretty incorrect. Okay, so uh, even in these toy examples, uh, we know naive methods really will uh, botch the the rare words. Okay, so, uh, so how do we fix this? Okay, so, so the main result here is an algorithm which can actually learn both P and Q, uh, which is what we care about, uh, with a sample size that is linear in, in the vocabulary size. Okay, so, so this is in the total variation distance. Uh, but the basic idea is that you can estimate this uh, this p hat uh, when you have w when your sample size n is about m, okay, and uh, and suppose p and q are somewhat separated because if the topics are the same, obviously you can't do anything, okay. So suppose they're they're different by some delta in total variation distance. Okay, so uh, so what's the basic idea? And it's a pretty intuitive algorithm. Okay, so. So, 
so, so here's, here's the basic idea uh, uh, of the algorithm, and I think it actually uh, gives us reasonable heuristics for a wider class of algorithms. Okay, so uh, suppose we, these two topics have some separation uh, between them, and they have to because if they weren't separated, uh, there would be no problem here. Okay, so this means there has to exist some set of words which are more likely under the math topic than the philosophy topic. And there has to exist some set of words uh, which are uh, more likely under the philosophy topic than the math topic. And, and by this, I mean significantly more likely. Uh, so, uh, you know, m words like topology, Gauss, Riemann uh, might be very heavy words in the math topic, which are, occur often. And words like, uh, you know, maybe Descartes, epistemology, uh, solipsism might occur more in the philosophy topic, okay? And if you lump these together, they both are, you know, have a reasonable chance of occurring, and they occur significantly more often in one topic than the other, okay? So suppose, uh, so let's call this an anchor set. So, so these are uh, sets of words. They don't have to be disjoint, because someone like Descartes, he's a philosopher and a, a, a mathematician, uh, but suppose we knew a set of words which are mostly about math and a set of words which are mostly about philosophy. Okay, how would we solve this problem? Okay, uh, it turns out uh, the pretty natural thing to do is let's look at the co-occurrences of our words uh, with these anchor sets. Okay, so we have a set of sort of mathy words and we have a set of philosophy words. For every word, let's look at the probability they occur with these anchor sets, okay? Uh, and, and the claim is this is easy to estimate because these anchor sets occur often, right? Th this, this matrix is really, uh, so, so this bigram matrix now is really a two by M matrix because I'm going to try to estimate the probability of every word occurring with, with, what, uh, with these anchor sets. So the anchor set, what I'm really going to do is lump all of these words together into one kind of meta word. Okay, and we can look at, under this model, what's the probability that some word occurs with the anchor set A? Well, it's going to be just half P of W times half P of A, where P of A is the probability under A, plus a half Q of W, half Q of A. Okay, uh, so this immediately gives us an algorithm that if, uh, if, if I knew these anchor sets and their probabilities, all I'm gonna do is figure out for every word how often it co-occurs with these sets, and then just solve a set of linear equations. But in words, that means I'm just gonna kind of balance uh, balance these two probabilities. So if I take a, a word like Descartes and I want to figure out uh, how much math and philosophy is, I'm just going to look at the co-occurrence of this word with these anchor words and kind of uh, balance the assignment of Descartes to P and Q appropriately. Okay, and that amounts to just solving this linear system uh, to, uh, to, figure out, uh, to, to figure out the P's and the Q's. And the reason this is very easy to do is I'm no longer looking at this gigantic M squared matrix. I'm really taking one, uh, one side of this matrix and collapsing it, okay? And, uh, and it's a very easy algorithm because for every word, uh, we're gonna solve this system separately. Okay. This is again, if we knew this anchor set. In a sense, this is intuitive, right? Because if someone has grounded me and given me a ton of stuff about math already, and if someone has grounded me and has given me a lot of frequently occurring words about philosophy, um, it's almost like I have crude labels, and then I can just bootstrap off of that. Okay, and uh, this algorithm, you can convince yourself clearly is linear size, and the intuition is that uh, I'm just using a matrix of size two by M. Okay, so that is really going to be a very dense matrix, uh, and, and intuitively that's why you can really get down to this 
uh, this linear sample size. Okay. But, you know, in a sense, the, the question is, we've kind of pushed the problem now into learning these anchor sets. Okay. And, uh, and this is the part where I think I'll uh, defer to the paper and we'll have a, a forthcoming version uh, coming out, uh, hopefully coming out soon. But uh, I think it's a problem that many of the algorithms really do fail in practice when we, when we have our data uh, with lots of zeros. And you know, th this algorithm is really two parts, which is how do we get off the ground, which is just how do we roughly figure out what math and philosophy are. Uh, and then once we have those, we can definitely piece it together with the second phase. Okay. And sometimes uh, there might be other information which, which will tell us about math and philosophy. Uh, but if we don't have that, uh, I would say the details are really how do we even just get off the ground, okay? And uh, and to get off the ground, um, I'll just sketch this out. Um, the the difficulty here is that um, in real data, just by chance, some words are going to occur more often than others. Okay, and this problem, uh, it, it basically makes it extremely difficult to, to get off the ground because when you try some eigenvector-based method, um, somehow everything just falls on these heavy words. Uh, and it seems like many other algorithms uh, suffer from this problem. And the, the way um, this has been addressed in sort of the the math community is you have to have some way of roughly figuring out uh, which things are occurring more often by chance and throwing them away. Okay, so uh, if this matrix was very homogeneous, meaning uh, you know, if the matrix we had uh, all of the rows were roughly uh, had equal mass then what you would do is throw out the rows and columns which were very, very heavy, and then try to run, run the algorithm based on that. Uh, the difficulty in these uh, realistic settings is, uh, in addition to this matrix being mostly zeros, it's also very, very imbalanced. So it's tricky to even get a guess as to which rows are occurring more often by chance. And uh, due to... Um, you know, in, in terms of a sketch, uh, the part of the first phase is a scheme to kind of detect uh, which things are occurring, more, uh, are occurring more often by chance and zeroing that stuff out. And we know from probability theory that these sort of events really will occur and they do actually cause lots of problems with, uh, with previous algorithms. Okay, so... Uh, so, so the basic idea of this algorithm is phase one, we're going to figure out this anchor set, and there we're going to be very careful about how we do an SVD operation, uh, which is we're going to try to basically run one of these spectral schemes and throw away rows and columns that seem unlikely. And then phase two, once we have the anchor sets, uh, phase two is easy. Okay, so... I'll just end by sort of mentioning that there are many questions we face where we have uh, these count matrices. Uh, as we get to richer settings, they become count tensors. And we really need to figure out how to uh, estimate in the sparse regime. And even in this uh, two-topic case, uh, it's actually pretty challenging to get things right. Uh, and this isn't uh, a problem, I'd argue, that is just an issue in theory because, uh, because in this sort of big data regime, in these settings, uh, we're effectively, uh, our data is effectively sparse. Okay, so in the remaining minute I have, I'll just um, give a plug for something very different, um, which is that, you know, in the last year, a bunch of uh, colleagues at UW and I have created a label data set in music. Uh, so this is very different, just a shameless plug for a cool new data set. 
And it's a data set where we have uh, sort of a few hundred classical uh, music recordings where we've annotated and marked up where uh, every note starts and stopped. We found an automated way to do this. So if you go to uh, my website or just search for MusicNet uh, or John's, uh, John Thixton's website, uh, the data set's freely available. It's got uh, like 30 plus hours of real recordings. And what it looks like is uh, for every instrument and note in the data set, it'll tell you when it starts and when it ends, like up to a millisecond range. Okay, and and uh, it's a, an exciting data set because it gives us a way to do machine learning in a very different uh, domain. So it's just a, a, a teaser for something different. Okay, so, uh, so I've sort of discussed uh, some questions with regard to information theoretic limits for learning uh, sort of a two-factor hidden variable model. And I think the one algorithmic uh, insight I want to mention here is that um, these questions really do connect to some questions um, you know, probabilists have been studying uh, for quite some time now, which is how do we discover structure in these sparse random graphs. And, uh, and the key connection is that this subproblem is very relevant to many other problems that, that are going to be coming up in sparse, uh, sparse estimation questions. And these are questions that are relevant because uh, the naive algorithms we have really are not estimating uh, effectively in, in this sparse regime. Uh, so thanks. And this is a joint work with um, a number of talented colleagues, Greg Valiant, Wei Ha Kang, and Ching Ching Wang. Thanks. Okay, maybe we have time for a very quick question. Yes. So, hi, Julia Hockma, University of Illinois. Okay. Hi, hi, Sean. Hey, um, I was wondering, so in standard language modeling, right, you would use something like a Turing smoothing. Yes. Right, which seems sort of very similar in spirit, right, in that you, you basically bucket your, your, you know, your counts, right? Could you, could you say a bit more about the relationship? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so the good Turing, uh, so, so in a sense, uh, like these, um, this deep learning paper I mentioned to, uh, some of these methods, when you're coming up with language models and doing deep learning models, you actually use these good Turing estimates in the tails of the distribution. Uh, now, here th the difficulty is that uh, good Turing estimates are, are used when everything is observed. Uh, so, so in a sense, like um, if I see the word York five times in my data set, but new always precedes it, then there's a good chance that New York goes together. Uh, because whereas if I see the word York and a different word precedes it every time, then I probably don't have a good idea of its distribution. Uh, now, the ideas for good Turing estimates really can't be utilized here because uh, we aren't actually observing the, the hidden topic. So in a sense, uh, if we could observe the hidden topic, then we could directly figure out how to do the smoothing. Uh, and in a sense, you could argue what these, uh, these random graph theory results are how we smooth count matrices when there's hidden structure because we don't actually, you know, we don't actually observe everything. Uh, and I think this is, uh, you know, really the right question is how do we basically smooth our data to get good estimates when there's really a uh, hidden structure in it. So. But yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. Great, thanks. So I want to introduce first a problem related to topic modeling, but it's much simpler. So it's good to see that first topic modeling is of, that, is of the same genre. So you're given a matrix with non-negative entries, and the question is to factor it into two matrices, a tall and skinny one, and you know the right dimensions there for C, but they have to be non-negative. If I didn't have non-negativity, it's a simple traditional problem, but non-negativity is hard and has a lot of applications. Topic modeling is of this genre, so it's nice to remember this picture. I'm going to introduce topic modeling. Um, you have lots of documents. We'll see that the largest corpus we'll deal with is 100 million documents. Um, there are k unknown topics. I don't tell you the topics. You have to find them. 
the document as well as the topic, we just go by word frequencies. It's a bag of words representation. We throw away order. Um, we are just given how many times each word occurs, normalized to one, sum to one. You, your job is to find the topics. That's too hard. You can show NP hardness, and it's in general very hard. So the way out of this, that one way out of this, is to assume a generative model, a stochastic model that generated the topic model. That makes the problem a little easier, because you don't have the worst case scenario to deal with. Uh, and that was well, probably the most used model was LDA, latent Dirichlet allocation. Uh, it is the most used model, not was, uh, by Blinding and Jordan. What, they, what their model says is for each topic, I'm going fast because I assume some of you or many of you are familiar with these things, but I want to just recap them. Um, for each document, I generate weights on each topic. And then I take the weighted combination of the topics. Topics are vectors, so I take the weighted combination of word frequencies. And then I generate words in the document independently of each other, one try, one word. Uh, one trial, one word, with these weighted combination as probabilities, right? I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, it's a nice model and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a but. The but refers to, you'll see what. Uh, so here's the model. Um, by the way, when I, uh, um, I made this slide six months ago and I was getting very worried that it'll be out of date, but apparently it's not. So. It's still, it's still current. Okay, so uh, the, uh, you, what you're given is just the term document matrix, right? So I give you, there are 10 to the 6 documents. For each document, I give you the word count. I have nicely ordered the words, but they are not given to you in ordered way. They are given alphabetically or something. So the word election occurs 9% uh, of the time. 9% of the words are election in the first document. 11% is Putin and so on and so forth, right? Now. Uh, what you have to find, and I don't give you this, is that matrix with three topics. Uh, the topics have weights for words. Uh, they add a columns added to one if you want to do a sanity check while you're not listening. But um, post facto, after I have done the job and found those, I can name them. That's uh, the, the, the names and topics are not given to you. So the first one might be called politics, right? And uh, uh, since the word is, name is not given, the second one might either be called weather or Seattle. Although that second part is wrong now, it's very nice uh, weather. Now, the hidden model might have generated the documents as follows. It has the topic matrix and says, I take 0.3 times the politics, 0.4 times weather, 0.3 times, um, I'm sorry, 0.3 times weather there, 0.4 times the second topic, and that combination gives me those numbers and I generate the first document from those with those probabilities. Now you see that the uh, counts are quite different from the probabilities, and that's typical. We do very few words generated, so the variance is enormously high. That's indeed a problem with these models, that the weighted combination and the probability vector, uh, the probability vector and the document may differ a lot. There's a lot of variance, right? Um, so uh, I this is the uh, numerical picture, but perhaps a better picture will come in a minute. It's geometric. But before I go there, I want to step back um, and sort of tell you a little bit about what, what we mean by the title of the session. And Sham already talked a little bit about this. So machine learning has studied these problems. The emphasis in machine learning is, um, is the model uh, and also simple heuristics to try to learn the model. So the algorithms are simple heuristics. Um, they work on many benchmarks, but they sometimes fail. Uh, in theory, we would like to develop algorithms which um, uh, have several properties, and I won't list them in order except to say the paper, I'm, the, what I'm going to talk about sort of combines the best of these. Uh, it then it was a series of papers, and then this is what we got. It's not that it happened overnight. Uh, will have empirically verifiable assumptions, and I'll tell you in a minute um, what that means. And we want proven time and error bounds. So the word provable refers to bounds on running time and error. Right? And uh, uh, it turns out that our current algorithm also scales up in addition to being provable, and it scales up to this is the size. Now, I want to note that this is on a single box. Right? I mean, you could do many bigger things if you, but we wanted to do it on a single box and we can do 
Uh, basically, six billion tokens means words. Six, six billion tokens, right? The word probable, I want to stress again because that was um, uh, something we want to get through. So if data was generated by unknown model, the algorithm should probably approximately find the generating model. The reason for saying this is this is unsupervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, we do not have a notion of the correct answer, right? And therefore, uh, proving that you're close to the correct answer is difficult unless you assume there was actually a model and now we have to prove that I get that hidden model. Okay. And we also want uh, polynomial time bounds. Uh, and here's a bunch of uh, references. Um, so uh, I guess sort of the theory-ish paper on non-negative matrix factorization that we had in 2012 uh, had topic modeling as a case. Um, then Aroraga and Moitra actually did it for topic modeling, uh, making certain assumptions. And I will tell you the assumptions in a minute. They're part of the model. There's a paper that Sham already talked about, tensor-based methods. Um, and uh, what uh, 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 <coughs> uh, well, part of the talk, a precursor to this talk, is a paper uh, which was in NIPS. Um, and of course, the scalability is something that uh, we'll, we'll stress. Uh, this is a picture I want you to remember. May, you may forget all the, you can forget all the stuff that I said so far. Please remember this picture. So here's a picture, right? We, we are sitting, if there are D words, D is 50,000, let's say, this is a picture in 50,000 dimensions. I'm trying to capture that by a picture on the, on the slide, right? So there are three topics here. The, these numbers correspond to the numbers we had in the example, but you don't have to remember the numbers. The three topics of the corners of a triangle, more generally a simplex, and the hidden model generates the crosses, which are weighted combinations of topics, right? The topics of the corners weighted or convex combinations, all the crosses are inside the triangle, they're convex combinations. I don't tell you the crosses, I observe only the circles. The circles are actual documents, so with this probability vector, I generated this document. Now you notice that some of the circles, or many of the circles, actually can be outside the triangle. They are not constrained to be convex combinations. And indeed, the variance is so high, this picture is not quite correct. Things are very far apart. Okay? Um, and so this, I, again, is sitting in 50,000 dimensions. I give you the circles, and I want you to find the corners, the three corners. The three corners of the topics. That's what I want you to find. Um, so here comes a departure from existing models that we have to make based on empirical observations. And uh, there's a little theory there. So I'll tell you what this is. So existing models all assume that the topic vectors are quite distinct from each other. It doesn't make sense to have uh, topics that are similar, that they are distinct from each other. Mathematically, that translates to being linearly independent. And I put very independent. I I linearly independent could just mean barely, but that's not good enough. So you assume that they are quite linearly independent. If that assumption were true, uh, and we want to scale up to, let's say, 5,000 topics. As the document corpus scales up, we want to scale up number of topics as well. We should have that the rank of the data matrix is at least 5,000. But rank is an observable quantity. I must say that even though this is not rocket science to say rank is observable, let's check if our model's rank and uh, the empirical rank are roughly similar. This has not been done before, but it's, it's a simple idea. So let's check the rank of data and see if it is that high. And the answer is no. Uh, I'll give you a little plot on the next slide. Uh, so we are not going to be able to empirically justify having a high rank where the topics are independent, high, in, high uh, number of topics where the topics are independent. So we have to depart from independence. So our model first assumes that there's a small number of linearly independent basic topics. Those are the corners of the triangle, three of them. Again, I'll show you another picture. And we actually have many more topics which are not just the corners, but convex combinations of the two basic vectors. So we use these convex combinations to get many more uh, topics. So here's a picture uh, about the rank. You've, maybe you've all seen how do you quantify the rank, singular values. Those who are familiar, you know what they are, but I won't define them. The singular values in, indeed drop off quite fast. In these uh, two data sets, we have done other data sets as well. So you cannot assume very high rank 
in, in some essential sense. So here's a picture of our model now. The, con the triangle was the same as the, what we had, that was the old traditional model. Now, instead of just the triangle topics, we now have six topics, okay? And they are on the edges of, they are, each of these is a convex combination of these basic topics, and we actually call them appropriately edge topics. You can have higher uh, con convex combinations have face topics, but right now edge topics. And if there aren't too many points near the corners, right, then this gives you a tighter description of uh, a, a tighter model that, that explains the data. Okay. That's all I will say intuitively for the model. I mean, the details are in the, in the paper, but this is all I'll say. So we define models with large number of dependent topics, which are convex combinations of the basic topics. So our models, as in any model, the general problem is hard, has some assumptions. The first assumption is that each topic has a set of catchwords. Catchwords should have high frequency in the topic compared to in other topics. So uh, uh, we saw Putin could be a catchword for the word politics, for the topic politics. It has higher frequency there than weather, right? Um, so um, it replaces an assumption which is much stronger, uh, in a sense, uh, of anchor words. Uh, the anchor words assumption, the difference is illustrated, again, just by an example here. Let's say the word home run uh, occurs, the anchor word assumption would be the word home run occurs exclusively, anchor words are exclusive to one topic, and also high frequency. Every tenth word is that particular word. Instead, our assumption assumes there's multiple words which are, have higher frequency in the topic than other topics, but also not a single, but the total frequency is at least one tenth, which is more reasonable. Uh, these are empirically verified assumptions, uh, and um, I won't go into the verification. Assumption two, I do want to get the assumptions through because they define the model. So assumption two is that each topic has a dominant top, each uh, document has a dominant topic, Dominant doesn't mean weight is 0.9, it means 0.2 or higher. When there are 100 topics, 0.2 is a fairly high thing compared to the average. And uh, other topics, it's less. But there are also going to be, a, there's going to be an assumption on pure documents. There are a f small fraction of documents which are purely on each topic. This you need to identify the corners. Uh, if there's nobody near the corner, you'll never see the corner. Okay. Um, all three assumptions are empirically verified. They probably hold in the old model. So this model is a proper generalization. It, it holds in the LDA model. That's mathematically provable. Uh, and uh, we also make some other technical assumptions. We also assume a stochastic model. And then um, use SVD as a, uh, as, a, as a big part of our tool. And I want to go a little bit into what happened with SVD. There's a bit of a story here. Uh, in the 90s, Sudeme uh, and others formulated uh, what's called latent semantic indexing using SVD. Um, and that was pre-topic model, um, a paper by one of our, our next speaker and his co-author actually proved that LSI does do topic modeling provably if there are certain, sim certain strong conditions that uh, every document is purely on one topic. But then people somehow assumed the converse holes, which they didn't prove or didn't even mention, but SVD got a bad rap, and it said people assumed that SVD can, does not help when there are multiple topics. And uh, in a way, LDA, one of, the, one of the motivations for LDA was this, in fact, as mentioned in the paper. Uh, and then there are papers uh, uh, by uh, people that I've quoted with other papers, but they, they call it beyond SVD, you know, Somehow SVD got a bad rap, but here SVD comes back. Uh, we do three simple steps. We threshold, do SVD and cluster, and then find catchwords. I'm going to illustrate these steps by pictures again. Um, uh, so if you don't remember this, it's all right. This is a picture. Uh, it looks very similar to the picture that Sham showed you. I promise you I didn't borrow his picture and turn it upside down because he had it the other way. But, but it, is, it is a picture I made up before I saw his talk. So here's the picture. So, so I've taken, what I've done here is I have rearranged the words to get catch words for topic one, topic two, topic three in that order. I've rearranged the documents, the columns, to get 
dominant topic one, documents with dominant topic one, two, three, and so on. After I do the rearrangement, this is not the way it's given. I do the rearrangement. Uh, the diagonal should have heavy blocks. Ideally, it should be only block diagonal, then it'll be very nice, but it doesn't happen. There's still a lot of smudge. We do something called thresholding. Thresholding just refers to, for each word, we find a threshold and set to zero if the frequency is below, set to one if it's above. Okay. It's actually a little more complicated, but to simplify matters, that's what we do. And you see that thresholding cleans up the picture a lot. Okay. I want to make another remark. There's a lot of black stuff. These are things that are not catchwords for any topic. This is typical. Uh, a good fraction of the words are not catchwords for any topic. So that's a tale that Sham was also referring to. You've got to get the tale right. And that's, uh, that's in fact, a complicated problem that make, makes our life a bit harder. So we develop an algorithm to find the correct threshold. They are different for different words, and then threshold at that. And uh, we do SVD and cluster. I won't, again, go into the details, except to go over this picture. So here are three clusters in this picture. We all know that we do k-means. K-means clustering has a problem that if you started badly, you're sunk. And here I've shown you a good start and a bad start. A good start is when you have one point in each cluster at the start, your, your home. A bad start is two points in one cluster. You can convince yourself you'll never escape from that. You're in trouble if you started badly, okay? So we use SVD to start right, and that's based on some earlier results. Now, again, let's go back to the picture and see what clustering has bought us. This is our old picture, right? Clustering has drawn these thick red lines. I've got all documents which have dominant topic one, two, and three, right? So, uh, I've clustered them out, right? Now, is this good enough? Normally, we would have just taken the average of each cluster, the mean of each cluster as the cluster center. That's no good, because we don't want somebody in the middle of that region. We want the corners, right? So the difficulty is finding the corners, real outliers. OK. So we cannot do what we do in clustering. We have to do this. Um, so here's what we do to find. Um, I'm going to run over this fast. It's several steps of the algorithm. We first find the catchwords for each topic. And we do that by taking certain fractiles. So uh, don't worry about the details. We find catchwords. And then we find the pure documents, documents purely on each topic, by taking exactly those documents which are very high total catchword frequency. All of this has to be proved. And we prove that in the paper these things do what what we claim they do. And then once you found the pure documents, they are near the corners. And just taking their average, that'll give you the corners. This is so far only finding the basic topics. Now we have to find the topics on the edges. Now, this is uh, intuitively to be thought of as a primary subject or a primary topic and a secondary topic. So we want to find the two top topics for each document. How do we do that? For each document, we take uh, the basic topic, basic primary topic, and the basic secondary topic as the two heaviest topics in frequency. And we take their average. There is some fuzz, so you have to worry about things being large enough. Then you take the average. And that gives you the edge topics. So that actually, in summary, completes the algorithm. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on empirical results. Um, um, so let me step back. As in all unsupervised learning problems, there is no gold standard for quality, because we do not know the correct answer, right? We cannot claim to know the correct answer. So here are the measures that have been used in the literature, and I'm going to use them. Uh, likelihood is a standard measure, is how likely is it that your model would have generated the data. The higher it is, the better the model that you've learned. Right? Uh, topic coherence measures, as it says there, uh, you take the top five words you found for each topic and see if they co-occur a lot in the whole corpus. If they did, you found perhaps a good set of words. Okay. Reconstruction error, uh, this is what we want to prove in theory, which is does the topic model constructed from a finite number of samples converge to the perceived ground truth? You cannot do this for real corpus because you don't know, uh, uh, the re you don't know what model generated it. Uh, we will sweep that problem under the rug for now, uh, but it can be dealt with. Okay. 
and we compare with uh, light LDA, I must say, so LDA has gone through years of very nice algorithmic development. Light LDA is, um, uh, in some sense, the state of the art. Uh, the Markov chain that is run uh, in LDA, this, in, in, in this algorithm, is much improved, and really nice, clever ideas have gone into this. So we compare it with light LDA. Uh, on some uh, standard corpus, and then uh, we give you the results. Uh, and um, so our algorithm, the conclusion is our algorithm mostly better than light LDA, not always, and we'll see um, the tables. Uh, the data sets we tried, just the sizes. Uh, so uh, tokens means the number of total number of words. N and Z is number of non-zeros, which is the number of distinct words. It's a bit smaller, so the largest one is six billion words on the whole, right? So let's stare at this. Uh, bold face is supposed to be better. And aisle is our algorithm. Okay. Uh, and LDA is a light LDA thing. Uh, let's see. So we are, okay, th th I wanted to point out the case where we are not better, which is Wikipedia, right? The topic coherence is, be topic coherence is uh, log of something, so it's negative. So the higher, the better still. So there, light LDA is better. Uh, we have some explanations for that, but let's not go into that. But otherwise, we will see that in general, uh, uh, we are better. Now, this is done with K0 is the number of basic topics, the corners. Number of corners is 100, 1,000, and 2,000. The number of total number of topics, the edge topics, are 10K, 20K, and 50K. Okay. So this is a picture to show that our algorithm, our algorithm uses sampling uh, that subsamples the corpus, not at the outset. If you ha you have to use the whole corpus for the entire algorithm, but for most of the algorithm we run on a subsample. This is showing that the subsampling does not destroy quality empirically. So. Uh, we did this with 100% and then with 10%. And we see that the quality does get worse, but not phenomenally worse. So in, in this case, quite a bit, but here it's not so much. So that's the change in quality by sampling just for our algorithm. Uh, this is a reconstruction error. This is, these are, so topic vectors are probability vectors. So we measure the L1 distance, okay? The maximum distance between two probability vectors is two the sum of uh, absolute values is two. And you see that um, in certain cases, we are almost at the maximum distance, right? Uh, anyway, so we do better on this than, uh, than light LDA. Um, time, um, so this tells you what kind of thing we used. Um, I'll give you the time in the next slide, right? So the times are here. So our algorithm without sampling is sometimes worse. For instance, here it's worse, here it's worse. Right? But with sampling, and again we get the results reported or with sampling, with sampling we are uh, doing better in time. All on single box, right, the implementations. Light LDA has a multi-box implementation as well, which we, don't, which we didn't do our, for our algorithm because we, we can do all of this in single box. So uh, again, this is time, running time, again, uh, as we go higher, the sampling uh, brings it below the running time for light LDA, whereas without sampling, it is not. So these are possible improvements we are thinking of. One thing I want to uh, back off and say a little bit is there was always this fear of SVD for very large matrices. Uh, partly, we don't, uh, we don't have a real barrier, but the point is that uh, it, this one of the ways, one of the things to uh, demonstrate it here is, in fact, you can do SVD on six billion uh, number of non-zeros or four billion number of non-zeros on a single box, right? We don't do full SVD. We only do the top 2,000 singular values and vectors. That can, in fact, be done. Th that, again, is not rocket science, but it's just the fact that it can be done uh, to remember where we are going. So uh, we are planning to improve the k-means plus plus and also work, for work on a multi-node implementation which can scale up beyond this. I see, I have to read the conclusion. I didn't read it yet, but okay. New topic models, large, and so on and so forth. Poly time, so, we, uh, so one more word about provable algorithms. Um, 
uh, uh, Shah also mentioned this. We do want algorithms that scale up. Generally, the demonstration that they scale up is by empirical verification, empirical results. But I want to claim that proofs are important because, in fact, we are going to deal with big data. We are going to deal with a large number of data sets. And if we don't prove our results, the benchmark results will not necessarily carry everywhere, right? So proofs are absolute. And uh, uh, I would even say there's a business reason, because you can tell your customers that I, I absolutely guarantee these running time and error bound. Okay. And uh, I think that's all I have. It's new project. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, I think I'm done. So uh, let's see. I think we have one quick question, possibly. If not, we can go to the next talk. Oh, thank you. Activity with the SVD. Okay. So we, we don't do much with abstract, and then finally we do a mapping to get what you said first. I see. So, so SVD is the tool that we can get into. Okay. Maybe one more question. If uh, you know the subject of NFF, uh, this non-negative matrix factorization, there there are many algorithms. So I'm wondering, uh, you pick the LDA. Is there a reason? No, it's on. I didn't tell you about it. I didn't think it would be an issue in the next book that we have. I think that the two are interchangeable. You have on probable algorithms for NMF. Okay. okay. So those are different. Okay. This here, the aim was only to do topic modeling. I guess I'll talk to you offline. Okay. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to introduce Santosh Vampala, who's our uh, third speaker. Um, Santosh has done uh, many things. He's on the faculty at Georgia Tech where he holds uh, the story chair of computer science. Um, he was uh, at MIT earlier. And well, he's going to talk about, not this, two challenges in ML. I stepped out briefly. Um, and there are two very exciting talks in the other sessions if you want to rethink your choice. And some an array of cookies too, so uh, please uh, feel free. But okay, here are two challenges, and uh, as a parenthesis, in theory, so remains to see if they are actually challenges. Let's see if you agree or disagree. Um, so the first is uh, robust model estimation. So we saw in the first two talks several excellent models for data, and uh, uh, well what happens if a small fraction of the data is not from the model? Um, even something as simple as PCA can totally break down. Can we hope to recover from that provably? This is work with Anup Rao and Kevin Lai. And then, uh, of course, the, the large mammal on the planet. Um, what can we say provably about deep learning? And you know, it's not even clear what the form of such a guarantee would be, uh, given especially a number of lower bounds. And uh, even perhaps even more relevant is, can we say that stochastic gradient descent provably works in some interesting set of conditions? And uh, what if the data is realizable? You know, it's actually coming from a neural net. Uh, what about that case? OK, so this will be work with Le Song, John Williams, and Bo Shi. All right, going back to the first, um, um, uh, classical estimation problems. So we have um, uh, data coming from some distribution. So in this example, it's a Gaussian, uh, whose parameters we don't know. And we'd like to estimate its mean and variance. So this we know. This is the foundations of statistics. And in this case, just the sample mean and sample variance are excellent estimators, optimal in some sense, in, 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 a, in a precise sense. And uh, more generally, the maximum likelihood estimator converges. Fisher uh, realized this and Wilkes proved it. Uh, but then back not, not uh, in many years ago, now 50 years ago, uh, Tuki asked, what if there are errors in the model? So what does that mean? What if your data is not exactly from a Gaussian or some other distribution whose parameters you'd like to learn, 
but rather uh, there's some noise that's been introduced to it that you're not aware of. You don't have a nice model for the noise. It's actually noise. Can you still accurately estimate the parameters of this, of the, of the underlying ground data set? It's, it's easy to motivate this from very practical things, but so, so I'll leave that out. Uh, here's another version. What if uh, your data is from a mixture of uh, two unknown Gaussians, standard classical model again, uh, Pearson's model, and uh, one question, it's been a, a mainstay of statistics and over the past uh, couple of decades in computer science is can you estimate all the parameters of two Gaussians? All you know is that it's a mixture of two Gaussians. Uh, um, and the answer is yes. In fact, it suffices to match just the first six moments. So this was already known in 1D, but uh, even in higher dimension now, you can do it with time. That's a polynomial for any fixed number of Gaussians. But now the question you would want to ask here is, what if the data is not exactly from two Gaussians? There's been some noise that's introduced. Okay. So one can ask this question uh, 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 in many ways, but let me also give you, a, maybe from an algorithmic point of view, PCA is used everywhere, clustering, mixtures, optimization, supervised learning, independent component analysis, and so on. Uh, you know, you project to the top K components as we saw, saw in Ravi's talk. Um, but what if the data is corrupted? You know, the data is what you really want the topics of, or, or the, the, the components of, plus a little bit, 1% of arbitrary noise. In this case, just K points, you don't even need 1%, constant number of points can destroy the entire PCA. Uh, we'd, we'd still like to estimate the original unknown covariance matrix because that's what it has it on. Okay, so this is the question. What about errors in the model itself? Now I have to tell you what, what, can, what are we assuming about the noise? Basically nothing, only how much noise, a bound on the amount of noise. So we would like to assume that some bounded fraction of the data is noise. Say is, in this talk it's eta. Eta fraction of the data is noise. Moreover, this noise is introduced after looking at the data. So imagine there's data that's clean and pure. It's not like somebody is um, obliviously generating noise. They know your model, they know your data, and then they get to add an eta fraction to destroy it, whatever they want. So it really is worst case noise. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a variant of what in statistics is Huber's contamination model. So again, there's an eta fraction of uh, uh, points added to the sample. Um, and uh, now you'd like to esti estimate the mean and covariance of the original distribution without data, okay. So uh, more precisely, what does estimate mean? You'd like to find uh, mean and covariance that are as close as possible in a suitable norm. In this talk, I'll just stick to the Euclidean norm. Um, now, so this, even this statement of the problem has several uh, uh, direct applications. Find the best fit distribution, that's more or less the statement of the problem. Uh, robust PCA, because if you estimate the covariance matrix agnostically, you can then run a standard PCA on that. Uh, robust independent component analysis, that takes some work, but there are existing algorithms for which you could plug in a robust estimator, robust hidden Markov models, and so on. Okay, now there are of course limits. You can't, you know, if your noise is large enough, you shouldn't be able to recover anything about the original data. What exactly are they? So it's going back to just the Gaussian. If the true distribution is just a 1D Gaussian, the best you can estimate, the best accuracy to which you can estimate the mean is an eta, the noise fraction, multiple of the standard deviation sigma. Why? Because an eta fraction of the data can move the mean by eta sigma, right? So if, if you have some Gaussian and I want to move the mean by, by some distance, when well, I get to move eta fraction of the data, I can move it by eta sigma. So you can't tell the difference between the original ga distribution and the one which you shifted absolutely no difference. Could have been either one, could have been the original, the true distribution. So the best error you can afford to have, you can guarantee is eta sigma, even information theoretically. Okay, so, so that's, that, that would be great to achieve. We'd like to get this optimal error in, in polynomial time, provably. Um, so first guess, of course, let's use the empirical mean and covariance. They work great for, uh, for, uh, for without noise. No, so they, they, they of course don't work. One point is enough to destroy this. This is something we all know. The mean is destroyed, can be destroyed by one point. So what do you use? Also uh, something probably everybody is familiar with, you could use the median, okay, in 1D, or the median absolute deviation to measure, to, to estimate the standard deviation, and these work. They work uh, to actually give you the eta sigma error. Um, now, the thing is, it's all nice in one dimension. We, of course, have data in high dimension, and uh, what can you do then? 
So two natural ideas. One of them is the coordinate-wise median. Just choose the median, but the uh, separate median in each coordinate, and that gives you an n-dimensional estimate of the mean. Another very nice idea is the geometric median, which is the solution to this optimization problem, which is convex, which is uh, to find uh, the point y, which minimizes the sum of the Euclidean distances to the data set. Not the square, just the Euclidean distances. If you put the square there, you will get back just the, the centroid, which is the, is the empirical mean, and that's useless. But this is sum of distances. This has applications on its own. Now the trouble is that both of these estimators, in the worst case, give you not eta sigma, but eta sigma square root n. So the error the, uh, these, these, met these estimators would, would incur grows polynomially with the dimension. That's just the, 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 what they're going to do. Uh, on the other hand, the lower bound is still only eta sigma. In fact, if you're allowed exponential time, you can get an estimator that's, whose error is only eta sigma. Okay. Um, so that's the gap, <laughs> like the bridge. And uh, to put it up there, there are methods. We, we just, we s we I already mentioned geometric medium. There's something called the two-key median that has to do with a nice generalization of the median, uh, which gives you the eta, I, I dropped the sigma term, gives you the eta optimal error up to constant, but it's NP hard to compute. Uh, there are other methods which uh, either take exponential time or give you large dependence on the time. This was the state of the art. Okay, so here's what one can do. So let's generalize a little bit, not Gaussians, but any distribution where the fourth moment is not too much larger than the second moment squared. So the ratio, f f the, the error guarantee depends on this parameter. In fact, it's essential, you can't avoid it. So I'm calling that number C4 here. So uh, for example, sub-Gaussians, exponentials, Gaussians, distributions with bounded fourth moments, all of these things fit here, and this is in high dimension. As long as you have this, that the fourth moment is not, is, is, is you know how much, not, you don't need to know, but, 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 but your error will depend on that. Uh, in this setting, you still have information theoretic lower bounds. Uh, they are slightly worse. So if, if instead of Gaussian, which was eta sigma, you assume only the fourth moment condition, then the best estimator you can have is not eta sigma, but eta to the three-fourth sigma. And just this 1D example already tells you that. Put your data uh, at minus sigma, sigma, and a tiny eta fraction of it uh, significantly further away, and your uh, uh, best estimator is, uh, is, is off by eta to the three-fourth sigma. So that's, that's the best you can do. Because it could have been either distribution with or without noise, and you can't tell the difference. OK, so here the, here's what you can do. So you can achieve eta to the three-fourth sigma with a square root log n factor. Moreover, if this is in the case when you know uh, that the, the covariance. And moreover, uh, the sample complexity is essentially optimal. It's linear in the dimension and over the error square. Uh, if you don't know the covariance, uh, then you can get eta to the square root and then uh, sigma times square root log n. The lower bound is still only 3 fourths, so it's slightly off in the eta still. But nevertheless, it's only root log n. Um, uh, uh, and the sample complexity is still uh, only linear in the dimension. Um, you can also estimate the covariance, so you don't, you know, uh, 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 not only the mean. This is just a simple trick of thinking of the covariance estimation itself as a mean estimation problem in a product space. Uh, and in this case, we, the, the factor is square root eta log n times the two norms. So you see here, the, here on the left, we have the Frobenius norm, the entire error of the covariance matrix. And on the right-hand side, it's the two norm. So it's a pretty sharp guarantee. And the sample complexity is now quadratic in n. Uh, for this, we need eighth moments to be bounded as well in terms of not just the fourth, but we need the eighth moments. Okay. Uh, concurrent with our work was uh, work by Diakonikolas, Comet, Kane, Lee, Moitra, and Stewart. Uh, appeared in the same conference. They actually get nearly optimal bounds for uh, some distributions, including Gaussians. They managed to replace the log n with log 1 over eta. They incurred higher sample complexity in some places, uh, but, but they've improved that since then. Uh, yeah. And I'll mention more about their work a little later. So here's the fourth moment condition. Again, going back to this, median doesn't work. Uh, even, with the, even, even median doesn't work in 1D. Right? Because uh, uh, if you try to use median here, you're going to pick either one side or the other side. That's, that's, that's. So the solution is to find the smallest interval that contains 1 minus eta fraction of the points rather than the median. 
smallest interval that contains one minus eta for a fraction of the points, and then take its centroid. So that, that works in 1D. So here's the main algorithm. So again, we have, uh, let's, I'm just going to describe it for the Gaussian case, but you can apply it for any of these distributions. Uh, your true data has a, is a Gaussian, and you've added noise to it. Mu I'm referring to as the original mean. Th you can think of it as zero if you want. And then mu S is a sample mean with the noise. Now, to estimate the mean, of course, it suffices to know wh which direction the mean shifted, or how, what was the, how much did the mean shift? Because once you know that, you subtract that and you're done. OK, so we'd like to estimate the mean shift because of the noise. So, because once you estimate that, you can project orthogonal to that mean shift, and you recover your, you know, everything else. Natural idea is a top principal component. Will the top principal component recover the mean shift direction? And the answer is no. You, you, know, you could place your noise in such a way that, that it's not going to be there, the mean shift direction. So here's the algorithm, it just has two steps. The first step is going to be a very weak outlier removal. We're going to get rid of points that could do a lot of damage by throwing out points outside a large enough ellipsoid. And the second step, maybe this is the interesting step, rather than doing principal component analysis where you directly go to the top component, we're going to project the top half principal components, n over two principal components, ignore the bottom half, just the top half, and then recurse on that, just recurse on that. Recurse means outlier removal followed by projection, outlier removal followed by projection till you get down to one dimension. So there's log n iterations. That's the entire algorithm. So again, if the dimension is one, we just return the median. Uh, uh, and uh, if it's higher, we discard points that are far away. And by, by far, I mean sigma times square root n far away. And you can estimate this just using the coordinate wise median. And uh, in the second step, we compute the top n over 2 eigen subspace, uh, recursively compute the mean in this subspace in the top n over 2. And for the bottom n over 2, just append the sample mean. So think of those as the coordinates. You have the top and over to subspace, so you recursively computed the mean. In the bottom and over to just take the sample mean, attach it, that's your entire mean. Here's a simulation. Here's the data. There's the outlier removal. After that, you here's your projection. You've recovered the mean shift vector. That, that's the algorithm. OK, and for the analysis, I'll just mention that it follows just from this one equation, writing down the covariance matrix. And the outlier removal controls the contributions of the noise and makes sure that the the, N, the top eigenvalue can, can, can go crazy, but the n over 2 at the eigenvalue can't go up much. Why? Because if it goes up, it has to affect the first n over 2. OK, that's controlled. And then the second part of the analysis is that when you do the projection, because you project the, the mean shift vector can't be too large in magnitude. And in fact, it's, uh, the, the total error you incur is only eta squared sigma squared. Since we do it log n times, you pick up a factor of log n, and that gives the guarantee. I won't say more since. I have to get to the second challenge. But here's a, 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 this, oh, this is on my laptop. Uh, what you see here are the plots, uh, the, the x-axis, the dimension. The yellow line is the true sample mean. And that's going to have some error, too, because there's the true data and the sample mean just based on how many samples you're using. And I chose the number of samples so that that's flat. The error is flat. And then uh, uh, there's the, the, the orange line is the geometric median. Well, one would have thought that's the state of the art before. And you can see the error goes up with dimension. And the blue line is the algorithm I just described. It's running in MATLAB. In fact, I thought I had code for it uh, up here. Or maybe I deleted that slide. OK. So here's an algorithm. Works for wide class. Needs only a linear number of samples for mean estimation, but quadratic. So right now, for covariance estimation, you can, if you'd like to run it, you can run it. Uh, and there's several uh, questions. The analysis, as far as we know, the log n that we have in, our, in the algorithm is not tight. Just we don't know. We're just saying log n because log n iterations. It's not clear that these errors can actually add up. Um, Dirk and Nicholas et al. have obtained several nice results, uh, extensions to other uh, to other applications and tighter bounds. Um, they, but there's many problems you could do this for. Topic models with noise. Can you prove that you can control the error because of the noise? Uh, okay, that's challenge one. Question if you want, otherwise I'll move on to challenge two, which is what about deep learning? So, but provably, obviously it works. <laughs> so uh, uh, lower bounds, by realizable, I mean that the data itself is being generated by a network. That, that you know it's the structure, but of course not the weights. Um, now, from the theory perspective, you know, there are these uh, extreme lower bounds. It's NPR to train a network with just three neurons, two and one. Okay, and this was shown by Arvind Blum and Don Rivers. And, and then if you make slightly 
stronger assumptions, and these are fairly standard complexity crypto assumptions, uh, you cannot efficiently learn even small depth two networks. Okay, so, uh, and then more recently, and this is uh, um, uh, quite related to our work, even with very nice input distributions, some specific standard deep learning algorithms will not work uh, on, on some families, and I'll, I'll mention more about this. So in the face of this, how do we f even formulate something? Now there are some positive results. They don't quite address the problem I'd like, but uh, for example, one can show that you can learn linear dynamical systems through gradient descent. Um, that for a single layer ReLU network with some special structure, convolution with non-overlapping uh, uh, um, sums, this can be done. And then if you use neural network alg training algorithms that are not gradient descent, maybe tensor-based or, or, or combinatorial for specific models, they do work approvably. Maybe a bit more samples, but nevertheless, polynomial time. Okay, so here's, a, here's what seems like a nice family of neural networks, right? I mean, nice meaning simple. This is what's generating the data. Each uh, input is just a Gaussian, standard Gaussian. There are essentially a linear number of, say, sigmoid units with weights that are nice and bounded. They're not too small or too large. And then uh, there's a linear sum at the other. So that's the data. And uh, this uh, activation function is not, it's not even something like a threshold which from which you can get a lot of hardness results. Let's just say it's smooth and Lipschitz. It's in fact, it's, it's something like that. In this case, we will call that parameter S the sharpness of the activation function. Um, and more generally, let's say each input is from some log concave distribution of your choice. It's a log concave product distribution, maybe a uniform on an interval, maybe an exponential, whatever. But, but something you know explicitly you choose. The activation function is any one of the well-known ones, but I'll, I'll describe a general class. And it's known to you. The data is coming from this distribution specifically and this gate, and it's small. And then the output is a sum. And then you get to do whatever you want in the training part. You can use uh, a fancy network, more layers, more gates, um, a, you know, some variant of gradient descent that you'd like that, that I haven't yet heard of, regularization, etc. Okay. And here's basically the, 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 the lower bound. That if your algorithm looks like it um, is based querying some black box functions of the input. By input, I mean both the input x and, the, of course, the label y or the output y, x, y pairs. It's evaluating some black box functions of this. Then, for example, gradients. You can think of that as a black box function. X, Y, give me back the gradient. Doesn't matter if you compute the gradient or somebody else computes the gradient. And it's to, with an accuracy, one over S root N. S is this sharpness parameter. You could think of it as a constant for now. But the point is the accuracy is as small as one over root N. Okay. Um, then you need actually an exponential number of such evaluations. There exists a family of functions that I'll describe explicitly in a minute for which you need an exponential number of such iterations, no matter what black box functions you're going to use. OK, let me try to make this more precise. But first, if you just had the special case of Gaussians and sigmoids, uh, there is an algorithm that will learn this under some additional assumptions. The weights, in particular, have to be well conditioned and so on. It's a tensor-based algorithm. It's not gradient descent. Um, and then there is a lower bound, at least against you know, uh, the most basic version of SGD with mean squared loss. And uh, that lower bound is for a non-realizable data, but, but similar in spirit. So, so uh, I want to mention that. Uh, OK. So here's the, here's the interpretation of a lower bound. Again, data is coming from a log concave distribution that you know. You can, and uh, uh, activation functions, you know. You know their sharpness parameter also. You know exactly what All you don't know are the weights in the middle layer. That's it. You know the output is a sum. And you get to run any algorithm of this form. You can estimate any function you want on the current weights and the data. OK? H. So for example, H could be gradient or second order gradient or so on. And then you get to apply an update of whatever value you want. H is just a bounded function. That's it. That small h and big h are the same thing. Sorry. Uh, and then you, that you, this is the form of the algorithm. OK. So what exactly is the guarantee? And how can we state such a guarantee? We, we all know we don't have explicit computational lower bounds for even very, very hard problems. So here is the form of the guarantee. 
Um, we think of these algorithms as what are called statistical query algorithms, which means that the algorithm is, is not explicitly seeing the data or doesn't need to see the data. It's just evaluating functions on the data. In particular, it's evaluating expectations of the data on a function of its choice. So example gradient. And, uh, uh, and two within some bounded error. Exactly what? Let me just make this precise. So if there's a function f and its expectation is p, then this oracle, model it as an oracle, vstat, with a parameter t, you can choose, returns the value p to within error smaller than 1 over t and square root p times 1 minus p over t. The right-hand side, the simple way to think about it, it's just the bound the er of the error. If, if, if you were tossing t Bernoulli coins, t independent Bernoulli coins, that would be your error bound. So it's within the error of t independent Bernoulli coins. Okay? So if you were sampling, you would need t samples to get that with constant probability. So it's like saying t samples. Okay, so if this is what you could do, but you get to pick your function each time, and your function could be super hard to compute, doesn't matter. But the question is how many iterations does it take? Uh, then in this framework, uh, you can capture basically all known supervised and unsupervised provable learning algorithms except Gaussian elimination, parity learning via Gaussian. That's the only example we know that doesn't fit in the framework and is, is, is efficient. And using the frame framework, you can, there are several tight lower bounds, so tight matching the upper bounds and exponential in many cases for other problems. I won't have time to go into these. So in this framework, here's the precise statement of the theorem. There exists a family of functions realized completely as neural networks with, say, a sigmoid layer, but could be replaced that with anything you want, so that any statistical query learning algorithm uh, which learns this to within error slightly better than, the uh, than what a constant function would give you uh, needs exponential number of queries with even if uh, each, each round uses basically linear in the dimension number of samples. Okay, uh, and as I said, it works for other, other, other sigmoids and so on. Now let, I'll conclude with the explicit description of the family. So if it's sigmoid, you know, all we do is we take a combination of two sigmoids to create a bump like that. Okay, so it's just a shifted uh, x and minus x there. And then you, you add several of them shifted. So the biases are different. You see the bias is 0, 2 over s, minus 2 over s, plus 2 over s, minus 4 over s, plus 4 over s, and so on. So it's like a little wave. It's almost periodic. It's not quite periodic because we're going to stop between minus, we're going to do it only in a bounded range. So the middle one will feel more effect than the others. So it's slightly damped periodic, and of course it's bounded. That's the nature of this middle construction. And you could do that with ReLUs, for example. Compose two to get a, something that's monotonic, and compose four to get a bump, and then you can add up the bump. Um, and here's the complete description. So uh, the, the middle layer is doing what we just said. The function is you're going to sum up an unknown subset of the input, and then each of those second hidden layer units is computing one of those biases so that it's a shifted sum. That's it. Okay. So rather than feeding it a 1D input, you're feeding it, it is still a 1D input, but it's a sum of a fixed subset of the n variables. Okay. But it's a smooth function. It's a completely explicit smooth function. Okay. So this is the function. And the size of the subset are picked to be n over 2. So there are, of course, exponentially many choices for these subsets. And the point is that if you didn't know which subset, any two subsets are highly uncorrelated. If you, you can test one subset, and the true subset might be off by only a constant number of inputs, but it, the effect of the function is huge. It changes the function by a constant. Okay. Now you can say, okay, that sounds great in theory. What about in practice? Generate data from this network and try some of the state-of-the-art uh, you know, um, uh, algorithms, which are now nicely available for everybody to run. I can run it on my laptop or on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a cluster. And this is what uh, Bo Xi did. And so, for example, for the sigmoid, you see the training error point 0, 0.035 there. That's, the, that's, that's the, what you'd get with a constant. If, if I just output constant all the time, you get that. Okay, this is the expected. The x-axis is the s square root n, the sharpness parameter times square root n. So as this sharpness parameter goes up, suddenly we go from basically zero error to error, which is, I don't know how to do better than that. So if you have a way to do better than this, by your favorite neural network algorithm, I'll be thrilled. And here is a, here is a, no, that's not special about sigmoids and Gaussians. Here are three different distributions, sigmoids and relus, exactly the same function, subset of n over two like this. 
And in all cases, you're hitting this threshold. Uh, so to conclude, what can neural networks learn efficiently? I don't know. But uh, a guess would be, what if the weight matrix is, is generic uh, or well-conditioned? But really, what real-world structure makes them easy to learn? Because it seems like they're doing well in practice. Although we should be careful, you know, if we didn't know max flow algorithm we were or shortest path, and we were just trying to run, say, greedy, uh, it might look good, might look better than what's been done before, but maybe it's not really working. <laughs> On the other hand, maybe it is, and we'd like to know why. Uh, or maybe uh, generic weights or something about the nature of the input is making it close to convex. I don't know. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, what about the assumption about the, how the input, the x, is generated? Yeah, so in, this, in, the, in the lower bound, the input can be any log concave function of your choice. So for example, each input uh, coordinate could be a Gaussian, or it could be uniform in an interval. Yes, but they're independent. Independent, yes. Yeah, and in practice, um, they are very far from independent. Good. So in one of the uh, plots, you see the last one there. They're actually generated from the uniform L1 ball, so there's a, they are not independent. I mean, they are not that far from being independent, but they're not explicitly independent. But yeah, it, uh, that could be a, the fact that input uh, coordinates are correlated. Maybe that's useful. Thank you.